We do apologise for the poor quality during the early part of the following recording of a sermon given by the late Dr Martin Lloyd-Jones. This was due to a fault on the tape recorder on which the recording was originally made. We have used digital technology to improve this, but some distortion does remain. And we hope this doesn't spoil your enjoyment of this sermon too much. Here's Dr Lloyd-Jones. I should like to call your attention this evening, as most of you will recall, to the words found in Paul's Epistle to the Romans in chapter 11, reading from the beginning of verse 18 to the end of the 22nd verse. From the beginning of the 18th to the end of the 22nd verse in the 11th chapter of Paul's Epistle to the Romans. Boast not, thy, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Now we'll say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God, on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, you remember what we're dealing with here, what the Apostle of Inuit is dealing with and which we therefore are considering. He's made this great and important general statement of his about the relative positions of the Jews and the Gentiles in the Christian church and in the family and in the people of God. And he's also considered their relationships to one another. Now, having done that, he turns aside for a moment to apply this in particular to the Gentiles. He, after all, as he's reminded them, is the apostle to the Gentiles, and he magnifies his office. He realizes they're in certain dangers, and he wants to warn them about these. He wants to show them the error involved in the danger, and also the terrible serious consequences of continuing in it. This, therefore, this section that we're looking at in the verses I've just read is a very pastoral and a very practical application of this great argument which the Apostle is developing in this chapter with respect to the Gentiles in particular. Very well. Now, I gave you a suggestive division of this little subsection last Friday evening. I suggested that we could, first of all, regard it from the mere standpoint of exposition. We must get the terms clear in our minds. We must be clear as to what the apostle is saying in actual words and expressions. That's exposition. Then I said there's certain vital teaching here, which we must note. You don't stop merely at a, another translation or at a paraphrase of a paragraph or a statement. The important thing always is to discover the teaching, the doctrine involved in the statement that you've expanded. And then, in the third place, I suggested that when we did this, we would find ourselves confronted by a problem. So our third division is the consideration of a special problem that is raised in this teaching here, <laughs> and particularly with regard to the question of the final perseverance of the saints. And then, lastly... I suggested that there is a very general application of this teaching, which is most apposite and relevant <coughs> to certain conditions in the Christian church at the present time. Very well. Now, we've dealt with the exposition. We've shown the meaning uh, of the terms, and uh, we indicated that what the apostle is really doing here is to preach a, a sermon, if you like, a sermonette on this whole question of boast not against the branches. That's the theme. Obviously, some of these Gentile Christians were boasting. They were using those false arguments that we saw in our exposition last week. They said the very fact that we are in at all proves that we must have something inherently good about us. And then, having had an answer to that, they say, well, very well, but after all, those Jews have been cut out in order that we might be put in. Doesn't that of necessity mean that we are superior, therefore? And we considered in the exposition the actual terms of the apostles' uh, reply. But now, uh, having uh, done that, we come to this second heading of the teaching, the teaching that uh, we find 
in, in this statement. Now, what is it? Well, the first thing, surely, we must discover is this, that our troubles do not come to an end when we become Christians. An impression is sometimes given, particularly in evangelism of a certain order, that once you come to Christ, your troubles are ended. Never have any more problems. And that to be a Christian means you have no difficulties, everything's clear to you, you've got it all, and uh, you, so you've done certain things, and well, there it is. You'll continue without any troubles or problems or trials in your life. Well, this passage we're looking at, if we had no other, is enough in and of itself to tell us that that just is not true. The moment we are born again and become Christian, we immediately need teaching. We need instruction. We need warnings, reproofs, reprimands, all the things which the Apostle lists in what he says about the Scriptures you remember in 2 Timothy 3.16. 3, we need them, and that's why we've got them. Hence, you see, the reason for the New Testament epistles. If this other idea were right, that all a man has got to do is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, exercise faith for justification and sanctification, all is well. If that were true, well then these New Testament epistles would never have been written at all. They never would have been necessary, and they certainly would never have been written. But here they are. And we find that they're full of teaching, full of reproofs, reprimands, corrections, and all these things. Why? Well, obviously for this reason. That the mere fact that we have become Christians doesn't mean we are perfect, either in understanding or in knowledge or in conduct or in behavior. We need a tremendous lot of instruction and information and guidance. That is why, you see, we are told about the first Christians that they so wisely continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, teaching, and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. That is why, negatively, we see the author of the epistle to the Hebrews reprimanding those Christians who neglect the assembling or their gathering of themselves together. These people who think they don't need the, the help of the church, they've arrived, but they haven't. And here, you see, we are reminded of all that. The Gentiles have been brought in, but they're in trouble, they're in danger even, and the apostle has to address this very serious and solemn exhortation to them. Very well. There's the first lesson. And a very important lesson it is. I think that I, like most other pastors, have seen more people get into trouble at this point, perhaps, than at any other. This kind of magical notion of the Christian life, that you take it all by faith, and you don't need instruction, and you don't need teaching. Nothing is more dangerous than that. The very existence of the New Testament epistles gives the lie direct to any such false ideas of the Christian life immediately. No, no, as Peter puts it, the newborn babe needs the sincere milk of the word that he may grow thereby. And the man who neglects the word, either in private reading or in preaching and exhortation and exposition and teaching, he's a man, I say, who is courting trouble, not to say disaster. Very well. That's general. Now, what is the particular teaching? Well, the first thing we find here is this, that our greatest danger always in this life, when we are not Christians and even when we become Christians, our greatest danger of all is our pride. Pride is the greatest enemy of men in all his states and conditions. Now, you notice how the apostle puts it, boast not. Don't boast against the branches, he says to these Gentiles. Or he puts it in other terms in the 20th verse. Be not high-minded. Here it is, boasting, high-mindedness. Oh, how often is this dealt with in the scripture? It's not surprising. This was the cause of the original fall of men. Pride. Indeed, it was the cause of the fall of the devil before that. Here is the root cause of all our evils and all our troubles. Pride. Having a wrong conceit of ourselves, this tendency to boast. 
and to be high-minded, to be puffed up in our conceit of ourselves. And, of course, the great apostle, he not only knew this as a matter of history and as uh, the great uh, principle that is taught right through the Bible, he knew it in his own personal experience. Here's the man who had been a proud, self-righteous Pharisee. Watch this word boastfuls of Paul. It's most interesting. Both on the negative and on the positive side. He keeps on using it. Sometimes it's uh, not translated as it should be in this authorized version or in other versions. Uh, the word glory, it means boast. Watch that word glory. It's the same word generally as this word for boasting. And the apostle, I say, knowing all about this, was constantly very watchful in this respect. Uh, and as you, see, as you see in his various epistles, oh, how often did he have to deal with it? Look at the whole problem in the church of Corinth. It was all really due to this, showing itself in different forms. Even the divisions as between Paul, Apollos, and Cephas was ultimately to be traced to this. My opinion, you see. This is my man. That's my man. Boasting. And so you get your divisions. Yeah. Boasting in men instead of boasting in the Lord only. And then you remember how you get it in the matter of knowledge. Strong brother, weaker brother. And how you get it especially in the matter of those spiritual gifts. That was the whole cause of the turmoil and the sectarianism, as it were, in the church of Corinth. It was pride. It was this spirit of boasting. It was high-mindedness. And we remember likewise how it is indeed the leading theme in the epistle to the Philippians. I nearly said that one almost thanks God for it there because it produced that great passage in Philippians 2 from 5 onwards. Let this mind be also in you that was in Christ Jesus. Well, he's reprimanding them for being high-minded. Every man looking on his own things, not on the things of others, and so on. And even in the last chapter, he has to make this appeal to Euodius and Syntyche, these two good women who'd helped him so much, but who now, because of this very evil thing, were dividing the church. Indeed, you find it running, as I say, right through the pages of the New Testament epistles. Now, here it is. This is the thing that he's dealing with here. And it's such a pernicious thing, such a terrible thing, so utterly contradictory of the spirit of the gospel, that we really can't just afford to note it and slip on. Let me say again that uh, uh, I'm not worthy to undo the latchet of his shoes, uh, this great apostle, but uh, God forbid that I should ever forget this application of the truth. I don't want to give you a head knowledge of the epistle to the, to the Romans. We are here to get at its teaching. Let's listen to the apostle as he addresses us through these early Gentiles on the danger of bursting. So let me put it like this. How does this tendency to bursting into pride show itself? Well, uh, we can divide this, if you like, posit into positive and negative. How does it show itself positively? Well, pride in various forms. Pride of nationality. What havoc that has wrought, not only outside Christ and the church, but in the church. Pride of nationality. Throughout the centuries, it has led to trouble. And though we become Christian, we are not immune to the pride of nationality and boasting in connection with it. I need say no more. Pride of ancestry. Sometimes pride of ancestry in that your forefathers may have been great or important religious people and important in the church. Boasting of that, resting on that, feeling it gives you some place of superiority. Oh, I could illustrate that to you at great length. Many a famous minister has fallen into that trap and has sometimes been instrumental in putting his own son into his own succession in a pastorate when the son wasn't fit to be there. You can think of endless illustrations of this. Then uh, sometimes it takes the form of, as it did mainly here with these Gentiles, pride in our own inherent worth. Feeling, of course, we are Christians because we are good people and so on. There's something good about us. Pride in our own works and activities. 
pride in our own moral outlook. And then the terrible danger of pride in our own understanding. Pride in our intellectual comprehension. Oh, again, I mustn't keep you, but what a terrible temptation this is. And the more intellectual a man is, the more he knows something of this very terrible danger. You should have understanding. Yes, but if you are proud of your understanding, it's of no value to you. None at all. And we are all subject to these things. Pride in our understanding, pride in the books we've read, pride in the number of books we've got. And you stand admiringly looking at them. Understanding, intellect, all this, it tends to puff up. Knowledge, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 8, puffeth up. Charity builds up. But knowledge always has this terrible tendency. It's not at all surprising. The intellect is God's greatest gift to men. And therefore the devil knows that, so he presses us on this. And leads us astray, understanding. And then, of course, pride in various other gifts. You find, as I say, the New Testament is full of this. I don't only mean the spiritual gifts, the special spiritual gifts, which are manifestations of the Spirit in power in a life. I even mean the pride in natural gifts, which can be of use and of service in the kingdom of God. Pride in speech. Pride in singing, so on. We, it's been a curse in the church so often. It has led to quarrels, disputes, and difficulties. What a horrible thing it is. And you see that the ways in which it can manifest itself are most protean. Uh, I'm simply giving you uh, some illustrations in order that you may examine yourselves in the light of all this. Well then, let's look at it negatively. And perhaps the most horrible aspect of pride and of boasting is the negative one. I'm not excusing the positive manifestations. There's nothing to be said for them. But I will say this for them, that bad as they are, they're not as bad as the negative manifestations of this unchristian spirit. How does it show itself negatively? Well, in general, I can sum it up by saying that it means despising others. Now, that's what these Gentiles were guilty of. The Jews, in the main, were outside the church. They'd been cut out. God, as it were, had put them on one side. They'd stumbled, as the apostle has been putting it. And the Gentiles began to look down upon them and to despise them. And as we've already seen, there has been this terrible danger in, amongst Gentiles ever since to despise the Jews, and not only to despise them, but to maltreat them and to persecute them and to handle them in a shameful and entirely indefensible manner. But this despise it. It's, it's the reflex of pride. You push yourself up, you push the other down. And as you push yourself up, you're certain to be pushing others down if you can. And you, you despise them because of their moral failure, for instance. Or you despise them because of their lack of knowledge. What does he know, you say? What does he have read? What does he understand? And so you despise him. And of course it's most prolific in the matter of these gifts, spiritual and other. You get the perfect exposition of that in 1 Corinthians 12. The man with a flashy great gifts despising the others. It, it's a, oh, the whole of life is dangerous. You see, we are not made perfect, as I say, and the devil is there. And he'll make you abuse the good. He can turn anything into a curse almost, even the gifts of God. The devil, if you let him do so, will make you so abuse them that they may become even a curse to you, though they're the gifts of God himself to you. And thus, this horrible spirit negatively shows itself in the tendency to despise. After all, say these Jews at this point, after all the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. That's the point. I'm so wonderful. And their hopeless have been cut out. There they are. Now, that was the spirit. And all I'm trying to show you is this, that in studying a passage like this, we are not simply studying ancient history. The Bible is an alive book. It's contemporary. This isn't simply something that was true then. It's true now. We are still Gentiles and still very much like them and fall into the same errors. 
There's nothing so fatal as to come to the Bible with a theoretical mind and outlook only. I've got my analysis of Romans 11. God forbid that you should stop at that. Apply it, my friend. Romans 11 is written to you. The apostles are addressing you and addressing me, not simply people of 1900 years ago. Very well. Now, that's, uh, those are some of the ways in which this uh, tendency to pride and to bursting manifests itself. Well, now, what does he tell us about this? What does it really mean? How do you deal with this? How do you get rid of it? Well, the first thing it's obvious you've got to do is this. You don't merely look at the manifestations of the thing, either positively or negatively. You do that. But then you say to yourself, well, now, what does this really mean? Well, the apostle makes it quite clear as to what it means. The moment you begin to burst of yourself in any shape or form, or to despise anybody else in any shape or form, what you're really doing is this. You are showing very clearly that you, after all, are thinking simply in terms of justification by works instead of justification by faith only. And it simply is that, and nothing else at all. You see, this old trouble with the Jews. We're the people of God. We be Abraham's seed. That justifies us. That's the thing they were resting on. And their works, Paul's autobiography in Philippians 3, all the boasting, you see, Hebrew of the Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, all his excellence as regards the dictates of the law. This is sheer pride and boasting, but it's all justification by works. And this is the extraordinary thing that you will often find that people who are clearest in their intellectual understanding of justification by faith only become guilty of dropping back onto works because they're now bursting about their understanding of the doctrine. The moment you do that, you're back into works. You're taking pride in it. And if you take pride in anything, the simple truth about you is that you become muddled and confused about this basic doctrine of justification by faith only. Here are Gentiles who've come into the church on the terms of justification by faith only. They've seen what the Jews couldn't see. But now, having done it, they've slipped back to it. Those who attend here regularly, particularly on Sunday mornings, will know that there is nothing that I've had to emphasize more often than just this thing. You are constantly having to watch that you don't slip back onto works and onto justification by works. It is more prolific in pastoral problems than anything else at all. It can work in endless ways. Let me give you one hurried illustration. People come in, they've been Christians, they fall into sin. And they come to me heartbroken, in absolute distress, feeling they've never been Christians. What's happened? Well, they've fallen back on justification by works. All I have to do is to point out this to them. I see, this one sin means that you're no longer a Christian. Do you realize the implications of it? It means that if you hadn't committed this sin, you would be a Christian. Very well, what decides whether you're a Christian or not is what you do or don't do. Where's the blood of Christ? Where is his perfect work? Is it what you do or don't do that decides? And then they see it. So we're always up against this danger. And we'll never be free from it. The devil will always try to get us back onto works. And there is nothing that shows that more plainly or clearly than this tendency to boast and to glory in self in any shape or form. Very well. Now there, you see, is the vital principle. And this is the principle we must apply right round in our lives. Don't merely look at the thing itself. Say to yourself, what does this imply? What does this mean? What does this really say about my whole position as regards doctrine? And you'll find that once in this instance that it always means you have slipped back again onto works. Very well. So the apostle gives us the answer to all that. He answers it now. And he answers it by saying this. Salvation is always and entirely by grace through faith. Now, he puts that here, of course, in terms of his own illustration, this illustration of the tree and the branches. If some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, 
were grafted in among them. They didn't graft themselves in, they'd been grafted in. And with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. They were a wild olive tree, nothing at all. It's only their position and their condition in which they're now receiving of the root and fatness of this olive tree that makes them what they are. Don't burst, he says. If thou burst, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. And on he goes to put it in terms of this great faith principle. Because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith, nothing else. Be not high-minded, but fear, and so on. Now then, I'm putting that to you now in the form of teaching, in the form of doctrine, in the form of this great principle, which is, of course, the central principle of the whole of the Epistle to the Romans. Salvation is always and entirely from beginning to end by grace through faith. There is no such thing as a hereditary salvation for anyone. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. There is no such thing as a, an hereditary salvation. Now the world is full of that, of course, still. Even still it is. We still talk about pagan countries, don't we? As if there was such a thing as a Christian country. What utter nonsense it is. There's no such thing as hereditary salvation. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, barbarian nor Scythian, bond nor free, male nor female. There is nothing, nothing at all. Or, if you like it, uh, in another form, there is no such thing as inherent worth in anybody. Now, this is absolutely fundamental. And isn't it extraordinary that we still find the Apostle writing this in the 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, uh, the Epistle to the Romans, because you would have thought that he'd put this right once and forever in the third chapter, where he says, you see, in verses 20 and following, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But remember, he's already said this. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them that are under the law. Why? Well, that every mouth shall be stopped. Not some mouths, but every mouth shall be stopped. And all the world, Gentile, Jew, Jew, Gentile, everybody, all the world, may become guilty before God. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all of sin and all have come short of the glory of God. All. There's no exception. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And the emphasis is on the freely and grace. Very well. I'm simply putting that to you in this form that there is no such thing as inherent worth in anybody. Not in any nation, not in any individual. The whole world lies guilty before God. There is none righteous. No, not one. And yet here are these foolish Gentiles who have come into the church because they've seen that, now saying, we are in. They were cut out because we are better. They were cut out to make room for us. Oh, I should imagine that at this point the Apostle felt like handing in his resignation. Now, what's the point of going on to people who can be such muddlers and can go back to an elementary mistake like that? It's all right, my friends. When a man enters the ministry, that's the first thing he's got to learn, that he must have endless patience and that the whole art of teaching is repetition. You say, oh, I preached my sermon on justification by faith. Right, I never do that again. I go on now. Well... I tremble to think what would happen to your church and congregation if you did it. You've got to go on repeating it. Sunday by Sunday. Because the devil in his subtlety will be dragging people back in the most subtle manner without their... If you'd asked these Gentiles, how is a man saved? 
They would have said without any hesitation, justification by faith only. When you put the question, they give the right answer. But you listen to their conversation. You listen to what they say. That's the way to judge people. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. It's all right to sit down and answer the questions properly, but you betray yourself by your ordinary conversation. And a man who boasts in any respect is denying the central primary principle and doctrine of justification by faith only. Oh, the New Testament's full of it. We are what we are. I am what I am. By the grace of God. Remember when he says that. He's just been saying that he's labored more than all the rest of them. But he doesn't make the mistake he knows. Though he has labored more than the rest of them, the apostle isn't proud of it. He always knows that he is what he is. By the grace of God. That I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of Christ. I am what I am, by the grace of God. Or let me put it still more plainly and strongly. All spiritual difference amongst men is the result of God's grace only. You can divide the world tonight into Christians and non-Christians. What makes the difference? There's only one answer. It isn't because you belong to a certain country. It isn't because you've had certain parents. Now, we all clear about this. Are the children of saintly Christians, of necessity Christians? I want to show you when I come to general application that there's a great deal of that kind of thinking still abroad. And there are some people who have their children baptized, as they call it, for that reason only. But you see, it's a denial of this old principle. What determines the spiritual difference that you see amongst men is nothing but God's grace. Nothing else at all. And you must never allow anything else to insinuate itself. So I go on to say this. The Christian life starts by faith. It continues by faith. It ends by faith. It is all of faith. Or put it like this, if you like. There is no other relationship between man and God at any time except on the basis of faith. Now, we saw in the fourth chapter of this great epistle that the apostle there surely has established this once and forever when he takes up the case of Abraham and of David. The Jews had got muddled over this. He says, look here, God has always dealt with our forefathers with us, with everybody, solely on the basis of faith. There is no other relationship possible between God and men except through faith. So, as he goes on saying in this epistle and in others, by grace are ye saved through faith. That's the method always. Or as he's put it in the fourth chapter, you remember, in that tremendous statement in verses 16 and 17. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abram, who is the father of us all. It is of faith. There is no other relationship possible. Don't bring your nationality into the church. Don't bring your ancestry, your family. Don't bring your gifts. Don't bring anything in here. Because it's useless, it's valueless. It doesn't count in the currency of heaven. It's not accepted. Nothing matters. Nothing counts. Save faith. Very well, then, those are some of the main statements which the apostle makes here. But he takes it a step further. And we've got to do this. He's repeating, in a sense, what he's argued out at greater length in the ninth chapter, in particular. We also saw the same thing appearing in the tenth chapter. Here it is once more. So let me put it in the form of a principle. It is a vital part of this teaching. Man is responsible for his damnation but he is in no sense responsible for his salvation. 
Now, you remember how we saw that several times in the ninth chapter and we followed the apostle as he works out this argument. It's what we call an antinomy. It seems to be contradictory. You can't encompass it with your mind. You can't understand it. Well, thank God we're not meant to understand it. But here it is plainly stated in the scripture. Man is responsible for his damnation. But he is in no sense responsible for his salvation. Now, where do I find that? Well, here it is. If some of the branches were broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, burst not against the branches. You've done nothing. Uh, if thou burst, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. You haven't saved yourselves. This is the action of God. It's God who grafts anybody in. Nobody can graft himself in. Nobody wants to. That hymn we've just been singing puts that to us so perfectly, doesn't it? Lord, I was blind, I could not see in thy marred visage any grace. Lord, I was deaf. Lord, I was dead. I could not bring my lifeless soul to seek for thee and so on. Dumb, deaf, blind, dead. Dead in trespasses and sin. And, you see, in terms of this picture, the wild olive tree. No good, no value at all, no fruit, worthless. And it can't, as I say, graft itself. It's God. He keeps on saying that, and he'll go on saying it more and more as we go on with this great argument. Well, he says, because of unbelief they were broken in, and thou standest by faith. If God spared not the natural branches... Take heed lest he also spare not thee. Now here, you see, is this other side, that a man is responsible for his damnation because of unbelief. They were broken off. That's the cause of their being broken off. Their unbelief. They're responsible for damnation, but not for salvation. And he's warning them uh, to be careful. And then, you see, he's going to say later on, if they abide not still in unbelief, they shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and were graft contrary to nature, this miracle of redemption into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted in to their own olive tree? And then he goes on to say that he knows that this is going to take place, and gives the reason for it. Now, the principle, I say, that we are involved in at this point is this. That unbelief for which we are responsible is always the cause of damnation. So that man is always responsible to God. The gospel is preached. You remember we saw it in chapter 10, uh, where he says, uh, how shall they... Preach unless they be sent, and so on. And here is the gospel preached. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Then suddenly, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. They have been called to obey the pro proclamation. The announcement has been made. The offer has been given. And they should obey it. If they don't, they're damned. And they're held responsible. Man is always responsible. Election, the doctrine of election does not say that man is not responsible. It says he is responsible. Man is responsible for his damnation. Unbelief is the cause of damnation. And a man is saved by faith. Where does his faith come from? It is entirely of grace. By grace are he saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is God quickening the dead by his spirit. The dead are lifeless. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he, because they are spiritually deserved. No, no. Salvation is altogether and entirely of God. Everybody who is a Christian here tonight is a Christian, not because you were born in this country, not because of your ancestry, not because of the family you were brought up in, not because you're such a good person naturally, not because you chose to believe. No, no. You are what you are by the grace of God. He drew me and I followed on, charmed to confess the voice divine. 
Here it is. Now it comes out here, you see, these two things. We, it isn't all. When I come to deal with a problem, I shall take that a step further. But I just announce it here as a part of the teaching. It is essential. They are out because of their unbelief. You are in because you're superior? Not at all. You are no superior to the people who've been cut out. You are in by grace. You've been grafted in because of the grace and the mercy of God. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Very well then. Now there is this first great matter which the Apostle teaches us in this little section. Let me, just to complete it for tonight, take you to the second matter in the teaching, which is obvious in the light of all I've been saying, so I needn't detain you. It is that the Apostle preaches and inculcates the constant need of humility, of godly fear, and of watchfulness. Look at it in verses 20 and 21. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded. But fear... What you say? Is it a part of the gospel of Christ to tell people to be afraid, to fear? It is. Not the popular gospel of today, perhaps, but it's the New Testament gospel. Fear. Be not high-minded, but fear. Be not, but. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. You watch the take heeds of the New Testament in the epistles. Take heed, watch, fear, be careful, take heed. Well, I needn't keep you. You remember a great instance of this. The apostle has to say this sort of thing to the Corinthians as well as to the Romans. And in that tenth chapter... He's been giving them the story of the children of Israel. All these things, he says, are written for our benefit upon whom the ends of the world have come. They murmured and so on. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. 1 Corinthians 10.11. Wherefore, wherefore, here's the message. Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There it is once and forever. Or take it in the epistle to the Philippians in that great chapter that I was referring to just now, having exhorted them to be humble, to have the mind of Christ in them. You remember he puts it like this, Wherefore, my beloved, in Philippians 2.12, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much, now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. That's New Testament teaching. How much have we heard of that teaching this century? Is that the popular holiness sanctification teaching? No, it isn't. I'm going to show you that. But here it is. Fear and trembling. And then take the great Hebrew passages. The epistle to the Hebrews, of course, has more of this kind of thing than any other section of the scripture. But listen to him. He's given this tremendous introduction in chapter 1 in the epistle to the Hebrews, showing the preeminence of Christ and, oh, perhaps surpassing almost anything that's ever said about our Lord in the whole of the New Testament in that third verse, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and so on, and showing his superiority to the angels. Immediately he says, therefore... We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. This is addressed to Christians, to believers, to church members. We ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. And I needn't remind you of the sixth chapter of Hebrews nor the tenth chapter of Hebrews. Very well. 
all the great warnings of Scripture are based upon the very argument that the Apostle is using here. It is addressed to people who are liable to burst and to say, we are in the church because we are what we are and not like those other people who are outside. The moment you say that, there's only one thing to say about you. You are speaking and thinking like a Pharisee, not a Christian. Any pride, any tendency to boast, any sense of superiority, in any sense at all, I am what I am because I'm such a learned fellow, because I've read so much, because I've got so many books, because I'm so moral. I'm unlike that other man, that publican especially. That's the antithesis of Christianity. Boast not because of the branches. Boast not against the branches. Don't boast at all. You've nothing to boast of. Nothing at all. The Christian is the man who says, I am what I am. By the grace of God, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the, ah, oh, but you say that's only conversion. That's only the beginning. No, no, on your deathbed, if you don't say that. Well, to say the very least, your understanding of it all is very defective. On your deathbed, you will still be nothing but a sinner, saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Our best is polluted. I dare not trust my sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Boast not, my dear friends. Take heed. Beware. Here, remember the lesson of the Jews and remember the danger as Gentiles of falling into that precise error even inside the Christian church. Well, God willing, we'll go on next Friday night to show how the apostle produces this spirit of fear and of carefulness and of taking heed. It's in verse 22. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we do indeed come unto thee in fear and trembling. We bless thy name that it is not a craven fear, but we come with reverence and godly fear because thou art who thou art. O oh Lord, we desire simply and humbly to thank thee that we are saved by grace and that we stand by grace and that we rely on nothing but grace. For we have seen again that if our salvation were to depend in any part or portion or any shape or form upon us, we would all be lost and we would all be damned. Even though thou didst give us a start, we would forfeit it, we would lose our way we would go astray. We bless thy name that we are what we are and ever shall be what we shall be solely, utterly and entirely because of thy grace toward us in Jesus Christ our Lord. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit Abide and continue with us now this night, throughout the remainder of this hour, short, uncertain, earthly life and pilgrimage, and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.